God bless you, everyone. My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Brave Hearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. Welcome. It's nice to see all of you. Today's agenda is six different things we'll be talking about today. The first thing we'll talk about is the great apostasy, which is related to breaking away from Christian values and beliefs. We'll talk about how many will depart from their faith. We see that now. We'll talk about how we can know the spirits and doctrines of demons. And we know that to be the case because it's in the news and it's also in our households. We'll talk about our relationship with Christ that keeps our relationships together. And we'll talk about what Apostle Paul was teaching for ministry. And we'll talk about Christianity is a journey. Our focus, our focus today is God's glory is what shines from us. It's not us, it's God's glory that shines from us. We'll also talk about the attentiveness to healing and deliverance. And we'll talk about what's important. The focus is repentance rather than the message of hope. Hope is important, but our focus tonight is on repentance. And we'll also share the message of seeking God's presence. The first thing I want to talk about is a vocabulary word. It's great to learn a new word that's focused on the Bible. Apostasy. What is apostasy? It's the abandonment or refusal of a religious or political belief. So what apostasy is in Christianity, it's the rejection of Christianity by someone who formerly was a Christian. The definition of apostasy is the act of leaving behind or straying from your religious or political beliefs or your principles. That's, that's what apostasy means. So an example of apostasy is when someone decides to become an atheist. That's an example, okay? So let's talk about the difference between another word, heresy uh, and versus apostasy. So what is the difference between heresy and apostasy? Well, heresy is, is when there's a departure uh, from the unity of the faith while believing. It is the denial or doubt of any defined doctrine. An example is homosexual Christians or false teachers in the ministry. That's heresy. Apostasy is the deliberate abandonment of Christian faith itself. So let's talk about the example scripture of apostasy. Let's go to 1st of Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Again, that's 1st of Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. And the scripture reads, Now the spirits speak expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from their faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I'm going to read that again. 1st of Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So let's break that down so that we can understand what apostasy is. First of all, the word expressly means clearly. It's very obvious. It's very clearly. Number two, to depart means to apostatize. That's the verb of apostasy. Um, number three, apostasy is the deliberate and permanent rejection of Christianity after a previous profession of faith in it. And that's how uh, atheism comes about. And the doctrines of devils, that is the doctrines taught by demons. So that is what apostasy is. Okay, now there are at least three dangers that lead to commit apostasy. One, temptations, two, deceptions, three, persecutions. Let's break that down further. Number one, temptations. Christians were tempted to engage in various vices that were part of their lives before they became Christians. Idolatry was one, sexual immorality, um, many others. Uh, number two, deceptions, deceptions. Christians encountered various heresies and false teachings spread by false teachers and prophets that threaten to seduce them away from the pure devotion to Christ. That's what false teachers do. And number three, persecutions. Christians were persecuted 
uh, by the governing powers of the day for their allegiance to Christ. It's related to what can happen with principalities. Many Christians were threatened with certain death if they would not deny Christ. We're getting close to those days again here in America. Okay, now let's talk about 1st of Timothy chapter 4, um, verse 1 through 3. Now we've already talked about verse 1 through 3. So first in Timothy's chapters 1 through 3, that emphasized personal matters relating to church worship. That was chapters one through three. Okay, we've covered that. Today we're talking about chapter four. In first of Timothy chapter four, the primary topic is dangers posed by false teachers and the specific responsibilities of various groups. And we're going to talk about that. So in first of Timothy chapter four, there are three parts to the chapter. There's three parts. It's a short chapter, it's 16 verses. So it's 1st of Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 16. And the first part is, we already talked about, the great apostasy. Number two, being a good servant to Christ. And number three, pay attention to ministry. Say to yourself, pay attention to ministry. So again, 1st of Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 16, has three parts, the great apostasy, being a good servant to Christ, and paying attention to ministry. Okay, now let's read the scripture. I'm going to read the scripture, 1st of Timothy chapter 4. It's the entire chapter I'll read. It's verse 1 through 16. So let's give reverence to the Lord. Verse 1, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. We read that scripture before. Speaking lies to hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now, the second part, starting in verse 6, is 1st of Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6, we're going to talk about being a good servant to Christ. Okay, so verse 6 says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise your exercise yourself towards godliness for bodily exercise profits a little but godliness is profitable for all things having promise of the life that is now is and of that which is to come this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance for to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living god who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. And starting in verse 12, it talks about paying attention to ministry. So here's verse 12. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So again, that's the end of First of Timothy chapter four. It's in three parts. Number one, the great apostasy, being a good servant of Jesus Christ is number two. And number three is pay attention to ministry. So let's break it down. Let's break it down. First of Timothy chapter four, verse one through five. And that was the great apostasy. See, as time goes on, some will depart from the biblical faith. 
Wow, what a surprise. They will pay attention to false teachers and false doctrine. Those who pay attention to those uh, false teachers and doctrine will harden their own conscience and viewpoints so they turn against God and the apostles' doctrine. Two prominent areas that they attack are marriage and food. And in the second part, 1 of Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to 11, that relates to being a good servant of Jesus Christ. Timothy is to teach, warn, and promote godliness. He is to reject legendary myths. They are meaningless. Physical exercise is good, but spiritual exercise is for godliness, and it's much more valuable. So Timothy should teach towards godliness. That's the focus. With godliness, one is focusing on the living God. And uh, the last part, which is 1st of Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 through 16, that relates to paying attention to ministry. So the Apostle Paul encourages Timothy to be an example for believers and also to continue with his public ministry. The way he personally acts and what he does in his public ministry are important. Personally, he is to demonstrate good speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. In his ministry, he is to have public reading of the scripture, exhort, teach, use his spiritual gift, and stay strong in his life and teaching. Now, let's talk a little bit about doctrines of demons. You see, scripture warns of, of doctrines of demons. The Apostle Paul says there are departures from the faith and are doctrines of demons. Basically, demons want people to depart from the true faith that God has revealed. This would include the denial of the basic truths of the Christian faith. So here are some examples. Number one, religious self-denial. Number two, formalism. Number three, departing from the faith. And number four, false doctrine. So there are four examples I'll talk about. So let me break it down. Number one, religious self-denial. Demons would like people to engage in religious atheism, atheism, I should say, or self-denial. A person can have the false impression that they are pleasing God by this attitude of self-denial. The devil wants you to believe he does not exist. It's the best lie, perhaps the most famous lie. Number two, what do I mean by formalism? One of the things in which demons would like people to be engaged in is mere religious formalism. This means to play church. No spiritual life exists. Going through all the motions of religion without any of uh, God's power is a demonic doctrine. Playing church is a demonic doctrine. Number three, departing from the faith. Rather than embracing the faith that has been once and for all revealed to believers, demonic influences would have people either add or subtract to what God has revealed in his word. That's deception. This is what Paul warned Timothy about when he said people would depart from the faith. And number four, false doctrine. The false doctrines that, demon, that the demons bring is the denial that Christ has come in flesh. Okay, so let's talk more about that fourth one. Let's talk more about false doctrine. You see, false doctrine is that which imposes some fundamental truth uh, or that which is necessary for salvation, your salvation, my salvation. So there'll be, oh, how many? Five of these that I'll talk about. Number one, number one. The f and again, what we're talking about here is false doctrine. Number one, the erasing of hell. A denial of hell directly contradicts Jesus' own words as seen in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, and chapter 25, verse 46, and is therefore a false doctrine. Number two, there are many paths to God. This false doctrine claims that since God is love, he will accept any religious effort as long as the practitioner is sincere. It also contradicts Jesus' direct words that he is the only way to God. And that's in John chapter 14, verse 6. And in number three, redefine Jesus Christ. This is the doctrine that denies the deity of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ, his sinless nature, his actual death, or his physical resurrection is a false doctrine when it is denied. Number four, Satan doesn't exist. This is the great lie. 
False teachers, the servants of Satan, try to appear as servants of righteousness, as shown in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15. But they will be known by their fruits, and that's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. So a false, the number five, a false teacher promoting false doctrine will show signs of pride, of greed, and rebellion. Did you hear that? Pride, greed, and rebellion. Those are the red flags. And they'll often promote or engage in sexual immorality. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the congregation. Here are some personal reasons why some people leave uh, church. This is some of the personal reasons people leave church. Uh, the first one is just simple burnout. These people came out of the gate too strong in the church. They showed up, they got excited and signed up for everything. They got so busy doing church, they failed to enjoy being the church. You have to watch yourself, don't burn out. The next one is distractions. These people got distracted by seemingly good things. They were playing uh, travel, ball, loving uh, the fast life, traveling every weekend over time. Their lifestyle of attending becomes the habit of not attending. And the next one, life change. These people had a lifestyle change, such as divorce or remarriage, or they move to a new community and never reconnect with a church. The next one is mistakes. These people messed up. They made a mistake that may be public, or at least they feel that it will be known, and that the, the place that should dispense grace appears either refuses it or they feel that it would. Many times when a person feels that way, it is more of a perception than reality. But the way a person feels about themselves may determine whether they remain committed to the church. The next one, power struggle. These people had an agenda say agenda yes they were pursuing an issue or a position and when their demands weren't met and they couldn't overpower this system they gone they left the next one is lack of connection these people never connected with others on a deeper level as a result they never felt really a part of the church the next thing we're going to talk about is what is ministry? Well, I'm going to talk about five things. Number one, overcoming challenges. Number two, being obedient to commitment. Number three, expanding the kingdom. Number four, fulfilling prophecy. And number five, being humble. You see, this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about. He was teaching this to Timothy. We talked about 1st of Timothy chapter 4. We talked about the great apostasy. We also talked about being a good servant. We also talked about paying attention to ministry. That's what this is all about. So today I'm going to share with you a personal story. So I'm going to talk to you about a personal story. Um, and this personal story is not out of pride. It is a testimony to illustrate an example. Everyone's testimony is powerful because it is a story about how God moves in people's lives. It shows the manifestations of God's plan. It gives others an example of how God changes lives. So again, my personal story is not out of pride. So I thank God for using me for his glory, not my glory, but for God's glory. My, again, my testimony is not about hope, it's about repentance. It's a new way of thinking, and it's about something that occurred over five years. So let me show you this. I'm just gonna grab uh, this award that I received uh, about, a, about a month ago. And um, what it is, it is an international award. And the international award is shiny and pretty, but the back is perhaps the most important. And what do you see? It's blank. And why is it blank? It is because there's a story behind the glory. The front of the award is what people are jealous of. The back of the award is what people aren't willing to do. They, it's the sacrifice. And that's what the story behind the glory is. So um, right now it's the year 2020. In 2015, I was seeking God's presence to an even greater level than I was before. 
So the Apostle Paul was holding Timothy accountable because God holds us accountable. The, the award taught me this, and it took me five years to realize it, okay? So um, as I said before, in 2015, I was seeking a greater level of God's presence. So um, what happened was um, my role as a professor ambassador speaking to the nations was uh, it started in that short year between my parents' deaths. My, my mother passed in uh, September of 2014, and my father passed in uh, September, I should say October of 2015. And in the middle, that's where I started my journey um, as an ambassador professor speaking to the nations. So the first thing that I had to do was I had to overcome challenges. More importantly, a tragedy, okay? Uh, number two, my wife and I, we renewed our vows on January 17th in the year 2015 um, at the church. Uh, we were obedient to commitment to each other because we recognized the institution of marriage as God has ordained it. So that was the second thing that we did. We were obedient to commitment. Again, this is 2015. Um, the, the other thing is it was before the Resurrection Center had purchased uh, the building. Um, I was working on uh, the finances. Um, I have a legal background. I have an accounting background. And so I was serving as legal uh, counsel and as the uh, accountant working on all the finances. And anyone who was with me during that journey knows the big, huge effort that was, uh, that went on. It was a very lengthy effort. Um, so uh, the pastors are a witness to that effort. So what I was doing in 2015 is I was expanding the kingdom or taking part in expanding the kingdom, I should say. Um, number four, um, our covering. Apostle Lord has prophesied that I would be speaking to the nations. She walked, she was at the altar and she walked to the back of the room because that's where my wife and I were because we were leaders serving the congregation. So we were standing in the back, keeping an eye on everything. But she went from the altar all the way to the back and said uh, that I'd be speaking to kings and presidents and prime ministers and world leaders. And, um, and five years later, here we are. Um, and that was the case. And uh, she told uh, my wife to uh, support me in this journey. So that's the other thing that I was doing, fulfilling prophecy. And number five, I don't ask people to call me ambassador or ambassador professor. I, it's Dave, okay? <laughs> it's Dave. Um, but I call p other people by their title because I respect them. So I have a behavior that is humble. So what is, this is what Apostle Paul was teaching Timothy. Overcome challenges, be obedient to commitment, expand the kingdom, fulfill prophecy, and be humble. That's what that international award uh, taught me. See, that's how you seek the kingdom of God. It's a testimony of repentance. Again, I was going to focus on hope today of a repentance. So that award taught me of a five-year journey, okay? God holds us accountable for our actions. God uses people to plant seeds. It's all God, it's all success that comes from a foundation. Everyone's testimony is powerful because it is a story of how God moves in people's lives. It shows the manifestations of God's plan. It gives others an example of how God changes lives. Now I'm going to give you another testimony and it's related to if you follow those examples of overcoming challenges, being obedient to commitment, expanding the kingdom, fulfilling prophecy and being humble, you'll have the favor and provision of God because you've done your part. So here, here's the story. Um, last Sunday, um, my wife and I, after finishing up some administrative things that we do after church service, we conducted those administrative things and then we uh, came home. And when we got home, uh, I, we live in a quiet street and we've got street side parking. So I parked the car in front of the house, my wife's car and my car. Well, what I saw 
was uh, the left rear fender was damaged. It was damaged. And uh, so I realized I had to figure out where that came from. Well, directly across the street from my wife's car is the driveway to the Airbnb. And the Airbnb owner is the house next door to that. So I went across the street. To make a long story short, um, I got in touch with the owner of the Airbnb and there we were, uh, we were looking at a video. There was a security camera video. And for me, I laugh at when I look at it because when I see it, uh, and I was able to use it to file my claim, is her, the Airbnb customer backed out of the driveway, hit the car, and with the security camera that's across the street, you could hear the crash, and then just drove off. It, it's like uh, the, 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 the driver did this, maybe, maybe took a drink of something, and then backed up and went boom, looked back and said, forget about it, and vroom, drove off. Okay, and this was uh, on Saturday night before going to church at 11.03 at night. So I realized something. On Sunday morning, what would have been my state of mind if I saw that before going to church because the car was already damaged? It's the way I walked and got into my car. I did not see the damage to my, my wife's car, and we took my car uh, to go. So God protected us so that we would not be disturbed or interrupted. What we do is we arrive an hour and a half uh, before uh, getting to church to get ready for the service. We're half an hour before the leaders so that we can be ready for the leaders and the pastors to arrive. Um, and, and so we were able to keep that commitment. Um, Here's the funny thing. I told you that uh, the owner of the Airbnb provided this video from the security camera. The accident happened on a Saturday. The camera was installed on Friday, the day before. So the owner of the Airbnb installed the camera and 24 hours later, that's what uh, happened, the big boom, the, the crash. So we, we got the camera, we're able to uh, find out who it was. And here's the funny thing, the Airbnb owner explained that for some unusual reason that they realize now, but they didn't know before, that, they, that the customers checked out early. <laughs> now we know why. Um, so um, that's one example, God takes care of you. So now, now we're able to file this claim, not pay a deductible, not be affected in our uh, insurance. Here's a reminder. And I'm just, just going to turn off that device that was making noise. Um, so uh, the other favorite provision is, is, is your family is, prevent, uh, is uh, protected. Um, the example that I have for my family is I just found out yesterday that my brother and my sister recovered from coronavirus. And I didn't even know they had coronavirus. I just found out yesterday that uh, they uh, recovered from coronavirus, okay? Um, so what we've done today is we did a focus on scripture. We talked about 1st of Timothy, chapter four, verse one through 16. Uh, we talked about three parts, the great apostasy. We talked about being a good servant of Jesus Christ. We talked about paying attention to ministry. Uh, the testimony was a focus on the third one, paying attention to ministry and not out of pride. I thank God for using me for his glory. The topics of discussion that we talked about, it was the great apostasy, breaking away from Christian values and beliefs. We talked about number two, how many will depart from their faith? We see that now. Number three, to know the spirits and uh, 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 I should say it again, to know the spirits of doctrines of demons. Uh, it's in the news and it's in households. Number four, our relationship with Christ keeps your relationships together. And Christianity is a journey. And you've just heard a testimony. You know, a, a reminder that God's glory is what shines from us, not us. It's God's glory that shines from us. We need to be attentive to healing and deliverance. And the focus should be on repentance rather than a message of hope, because we're in the end times where repentance is most important. And we need to also focus on a message, 
that we hear and receive of seeking God's presence. My name is David Ewan from the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez, and this is the Resurrection Center. <music>